What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Finance Simplified, the official podcast for street fins. We're here to break down the world of finance for you to understand from a relatable perspective with discussions with experts. This is episode 28, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alex Patel. How's life been since our last episode? Hey, Rohan. I've been doing well. Just recently got back home, so I'm looking forward to spending some time with my family. Yep, same here. Just been with my family for the past week at home. I will be moving down to LA soon, and I'll start my sophomore year at USC on the 23rd of August. That's great to hear. Now, as we mentioned in the previous episode, we're starting a Discord so that you guys can interact with us more directly, giving us tips and suggestions for new episodes and improvements, as well as being more engaged with a community of driven people who want to learn finance. We'll be active on this Discord, promoting various topics of the week to discuss and having more conversations around our episode's topics. We'll also be accepting shout-out requests on the Discord. If you'd like to join our Discord and start connecting with our community of listeners, check out the Discord link in the description. Email us at fspodcast at streetfins.com if you have any trouble with accessing it. We also want to remind you to follow us on social media at Streetfins on Twitter and Instagram for updates and to sign up for a newsletter, Finance Simplified, for simplified weekly recaps, finance tips, and updates about the podcast. So Alex, this is part two of our conversation with legendary investor Joel Greenblatt on the topic of simplifying value investing. What did we talk about in part one? In part one, we talked about the basics of value investing, contrarianism, viewing history, perceptions of risk, and much more. We'll be getting more into the relationship between growth and value investing, current market conditions, how Joel looks at companies, his career as a professor, and much more. But before we continue, we just want to remind you that if you're learning from our episodes and want to keep supporting what we're doing, we'd be eternally grateful if you gave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Even if you're listening to this on another platform, as long as you have an Apple account or device, you can support us with the rating. Additionally, we'd love to know what feedback you have for us, so join us on Discord to send us any feedback to let us know how we're doing and what you would like to see from us going forward. Also, stay tuned till the very end of our episode because we'll be teasing our next episode's guest. The first person to send us a message on Discord with the correct guest will get a shout out. Now, let's continue simplifying value investing. Welcome to Finance Simplified, the official podcast for StreetFins created by students that simplifies the seemingly complex and confusing world of money. We're your hosts, Rohan and Alex. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. All right. So we've kind of talked a little bit about kind of the basics of value investing just now. I'm kind of more curious to go more in depth into kind of the modern context of value investing. So value investing today Howard Marks recently put out a memo that talked about how value and growth, there's like a dividing line that many people try to like categorize them as either a value investor or as a growth investor. Now, you know, I think one of the conclusions he drew is that in most cases, that dividing line is artificial and it just precludes opportunities. Where do you stand on this kind of difference between value investing and growth investing? Is growth investing at this point just kind of like a short-term speculative behavior, or is there still some more fundamentals to it? And is it more like value investing than we initially thought? Yeah, I think what we talked about before is really relevant here. There is no growth investing in value investing. There's investing, okay? Growth and value are tied at the hip, meaning growth is how much a company is going to grow over time. Its earnings and its cash flows go into valuing a business. and you know, the distinction between growth and value investing doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's very hard to, I think what Howard was getting at his memo, at least what I took out of it was, there are a lot of companies that appear to be high priced now, trading at 30 or 40 times earnings, perhaps that used to be considered, certainly not value investments. They're, these are fast growing companies that are trading at high multiples. And the expectation is they will continue to do so, usually when you're willing to pay that kind of multiple. And the question was, can those be value investments? Can they be some bargains? Can they actually be bargain priced? And because some of the businesses he was talking about with the advent of the internet and the networks that can be created and the amount of capital that's needed and the moats that can be created for these businesses... You know, we're talking about the Amazons and Googles of the world and the Microsofts. These, they might be some of the best businesses 
for sure that I've ever seen, and they may deserve much higher multiples than the market's giving them. So even though they appear based on historic basis to have high multiples, even though their growth rates are still high, and under traditional ways of categorizing, you would call them growth stocks, they may be value stocks if you think about it the way we do, which is I'm valuing the business and its future prospects. And it turns out that price isn't so high, even though based on historical metrics, it would have been considered so. And so it has to be looked at in those eyes. And some things that typical value investors that have been categorized as value investors would typically shun because they have the tail marks. They're fast growing, they're trading at high multiples, are order automatically eliminated. Not so if you're a more holistic value investor and taking into account that the value of the business franchise and how long these things can grow, how much blue sky they have to continue to grow. And you know the dynamics are perhaps a little different than what we've seen in history. And therefore, we have to be a little more open-minded as to what you know traditional metrics matter and which don't. Yeah, there's quite a bit to unpack there. I mean, I think Warren Buffett once said in one of his letters that it's pretty fallacious to think that value and growth are different. As you mentioned, they're joined at the hip. And I think he also said that growth is just a part of the equation for value. So they're one and the same. And you know that other point you're making about how the so-called quote unquote high price tech stocks, it just kind of speaks to just value investing evolving with the current market environment. The stuff that was valued at like seven or eight X earnings is now not necessarily the best measure because just times are changing. We have cooler companies coming from the internet, from tech, and what matters more is, you know, things like how strong the business model is and not necessarily like an emphasis on something that represented an older time, right? Well, what I would say is this, you know, once again, Buffett, time is the friend of a good business and the enemy of a bad business. So another way to think about it is, let's say you think if you were in control of the business, it's worth $10 today and you can buy it at $6 that looks like a good margin of safety. But if the business is shrinking over time, meaning it's going to be less valuable in a few years, or it's the risk of being less valuable, or its earnings are potentially risky and might go down, and that $10 shrinks to $8, your margin of safety is shrinking. And if you compare that to something where you pay, you think something's worth $10 today, and you pay $8 for it, but you think that $10 is going to grow to $12 or $14, then your margin of safety is actually growing over time. And that may be the better bargain. And so you're really looking at you know, what's it worth today? What will be worth a few years from now? How confident you are of those things? And you know, that'll keep you out of the value traps that you, know, you I think, alluded to. Yeah. I'd actually like to get sort of your perspective on value investing today and maybe with respect to this really low interest rate environment that I think we're going to expect through 2022, you know, what are your thoughts on sort of some of the multiples right now? And, and is it a lot more difficult to find value now in this sort of different paradigm with maybe the Fed propping up the economy and a lot of different stimuli packages being passed? You know, what are your takes on sort of the market conditions right now? Yeah, well, it's tough to know. And I'm not sure it's, it's that valuable a question in this sense. Most people, whether you think the market in general or your opportunity set is expensive or cheap, none of us are that good at predicting the market. So we don't generally go 100% long the market in our own portfolio or long zero, owning nothing. Okay, We pick an exposure long term to the market, or at least this is what I recommend, and give it how much risk we're willing to take. So even if the stock market's expensive, you know, the bond market seems also super expensive. And so there's really not a great place to hide. So what you're really deciding is, look, normally I have a 60% exposure to the market because when the market falls 40%, that's all the pain I can take. Let's just say that's you. And you're really bullish because you think things are cheap and you're getting a lot of bargains. Maybe you'll go 70% long. And if you think things are expensive, maybe you go 50% long. And dollars to donuts, you're probably going to be wrong in your assessment because most people aren't very good at that and are pretty emotional about it. But let's say you leave it in that range. That's your decision. But once you've decided, I want to be 50% long the market, 60% long the market, 70% exposure to the market, then the question is, all right, for that portion of my portfolio, I want to be long the market. What's the smartest thing to do? So then you're looking for the cheapest things you can find 
rather than the cheapest thing of all time. I'm going to wait around for 10 years for the cheapest thing of all time. I'm going to, because I don't know what's going to happen for that portion, whether I'm 50, 60, 70% long the market, what's the smartest way to take that exposure? And so I'm looking for the cheapest things I can find at the moment, right? And then that sort of takes the question out. If you start throwing in, well, sometimes I want to be 90% long, sometimes I want to be 10% long, that is another thing that people are really, really bad at. So I would suggest keeping a market exposure and making your, you know, pretty close to whatever your risk tolerances are, whether that is 60, 70, 80% based on your age, based on, you know, whatever your tolerance for risk, whatever that is, what's the best thing to do with that money? What's the best way to deploy that 60% long and make that the challenge? And then it makes some of your questions a little bit easier. You know, I don't know where interest rates are going. Obviously, inflation is kicking up. I don't know how permanent that is. You know, we throw in the fact that inflation kicked up a lot at the end of World War II, but the government was able to keep interest rates low and maybe they'll do that again. And then, you know, even if inflation kicks up, it doesn't necessarily follow that interest rates will follow inflation because the government is so involved in the the bond market at the moment. And so, you know, those are a lot of unknowns. And so I'm trying to simplify things once again by saying, look, what if I'm going to have a certain exposure to the equity market, what's the smartest way to deploy that exposure? And so therefore, I'm looking for the cheapest things I can find. And that's a relative question that uh, it's easier for me to answer than absolutely, is this a great time to invest or not? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So I want to kind of go back to just the, the philosophy of value investing. And you know, many people have kind of summarized that value investing and really investing in general. And I know you mentioned that you know, there's not value or growth, there's just investing. Many have just kind of said like, oh, the main idea is this buy low, sell high, or maybe go like bargain hunting. But that just seems to be pretty common sense. You just buy something and sell it at a higher price, right? That should be present across any type of investing. But you know that also gives rise to things like you know. Day well, I, w- I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't put it as buy it low and sell it at a, a higher price. I would say buy it beneath what it's worth and wait till that value is more fully reflected and sell it if you find something that gives you a better risk reward once this is no longer cheap. Right. And I guess that's a very important distinction to make between buy low, sell high, which is just in regards to price, which obviously anyone who can just day trade can just buy and you know buy low and sell high and they can call it just based on the price. But when you're talking about longer term investing and understanding the what a business is worth and paying a lot less for that, it's buy low compared to the value of the business and then wait till it kind of appreciates to the value, which hopefully will be at a higher appreciation that you can then sell it at. Another question I had is, you know, obviously your value investing approach really applies to me equity markets, right? But could someone be a value investor, let's say in another type of asset market, bonds, derivatives, other types of things? Is that ever possible or does it kind of just work for stocks? No, of course. If you're able to value an asset, it could be real estate, it could be bonds, it could be stocks, whatever it might be. If you're able to value an asset and, you know, buy it at a bargain price relative to that value, that would be what I would call value investing or investing, however you want to call it. But of course, you could buy real estate well, you could buy bonds well, you can buy stocks well, you can buy entire businesses well. Yeah. And I think we see that, especially with credit, right? Or like places like Oak Tree Capital, where they're not focused as much on equities and more so special situations and private credit and things like that. You can see that they still carry forth the value investing philosophy and apply it to those, even though those opportunities might not always be available to retail investors, it definitely can just be applied in all parts of the investment world. Most people have access to equity markets and don't have access to some of the more distressed, illiquid bond markets. And so that's an edge that they have and they're specialists in that area, whether it's bankruptcy or, you know, servicing value in that way. And they're exposed to a lot more of the market than the average person gets exposed to equity market. Yeah. So actually, we've sort of talked about the current state of value investing and maybe investing in general. And I'd like to talk really about sort of the future. And one of the things we talked about previously is with the Howard Marks memo, talking about stocks that maybe have a rich valuation, 30 to 40 PE, but have a moat. I think this is you know one of the things that's evolved with the internet, as you said, Compared to the 1950s, where some of the most valuable companies were big balance sheet companies. So I'm thinking about oil giants, U.S. Steel, General Electric, AT&T, telecom companies. 
which just, you know, really isn't the case anymore. Now you have Warren Buffett, where most of his portfolio is in a tech company, Apple. Do you see sort of a paradigm shift in terms of having to value companies? And, you know, Warren Buffett talks about that going concern where for companies, you know, maybe liquidated, you want to know that the balance sheet's strong, there's assets that can be sold off. Whereas, you know, now there's maybe asset light companies, but they still generate really strong cash flows. How does that change your perspective? Yeah, I mean, it still goes back to a moat. I mean, one of the barriers to entry for those big companies was it took so much capital to compete with them, you know, and you had economies of scale and all those other things that they had a a moat that way, that it was very hard for competitors to come in and break that cost structure. And with some of these modern moats, you know, if Google has 80% of the search business, they have better data, they can keep making their results better. And it's a flywheel type thing where the more people who use it, the better it gets. The better it gets, the more people use it. And the stickier it is and the harder to break it in. And so, you know, that's the kind of moats that we have now. And so your job as an analyst is to assess the moats. I mean, you know, my space isn't particularly big anymore. And that was pretty big. You guys are probably too young, but not too long ago, BlackBerry had 50% of the phone market, you know, the email phone market. And, you know, they don't even have any of it anymore. So you have to assess all these things and some moats are better than others and things are always changing and that's the job of an analyst. And many of the problems are too tough for just normal people to figure out. And then you have no business in investing in that business and you're better off finding one you can understand better, right? Yeah, great point. And one of the great things I think about having you on the podcast is you're both a professional investor as well as a teacher at Columbia Business School. So you interact with students like us. So my next question is, what do you tell your students about value investing? And have you changed your approach in teaching the principles of value investing, maybe compared to when you were a student at Wharton? Have you changed your own views on the style with that perspective as a teacher? Sure. Well, at Wharton, it was more theoretical. And at Columbia, you know, Ben Graham taught there and they have a tradition of the value investing program. And they were very much more open to practitioners. You know, investing is kind of an apprentice type business. It's not really a science. It's a combination of art, science, knowledge, and ability to assess risk reward. You know, it's a combination of skills none of which require, as Buffett would say, particularly high IQ, but do require a good emotional IQ where because prices can be so volatile in the short term, you have to understand what you're doing. You have to have basic principles that keep you in the game long enough to collect, even if you do good work. And that's very hard to do. And then, of course, if you're a professional, you have clients who put more pressure on you and you're judged over shorter periods of time. So there's an agency problem of you know, what's better over the long term, what's better over the short term, how are you going to be judged, you know, all these things come into play to make it more difficult. I view them as great things. These are things that will continue forever. You know, there will be this move. The big secret was patience because short term stock trading, that's going to be arbitraged away, little pieces of information that, you know, you get it a little quicker, or you assess it a little better, or there's artificial intelligence, or you have faster trading algorithms, or who the heck knows, those kind of opportunities get arbitraged away, but very hard to arbitrage away things that take years to play out. You know, the way I always describe it is, hey, gold is trading in New York at $1,800. It's trading in London at 1801. An arbitrageur will buy gold in New York at 1800, simultaneously sell it in London at 1801 make a dollar arbitrage profit. The act of buying in New York will push it up. The act of selling in London will push it down. And very quickly, all these people on trading desks will arbitrage that away. But if I told you gold's trading at New York for $1,800 and sometime in the next two or three years, it's going to go up, but it could lose 30 or 40% of its value. In the meantime, there's no desk out there that someone's able to take that risk to just hang out for that profit because they may go broke while they're waiting or get fired or you name it. So that's not an arbitrage opportunity. And, you know, so Bill Miller and others would call that time arbitrage and time arbitrage. The time frames are getting shorter, not longer in the investment world. People's patience are getting shorter. People getting a lot of data out there. So people getting judged over shorter periods of time. So it's just getting harder and harder to have a long-term perspective. And so I think that's the last man standing. And that's what we do. And that's what I think 
the edge will always be for individual investors over institutions to have these opportunities. I'm not saying it's easy. What I'm saying is having that ability to be patient is hugely valuable and should remain. Yeah, I think that's hugely important. I read your book, The Big Secret for Small Investors, and in it, you were going through chapter by chapter, building up to this kind of big strategy that you thought would work really well for small investors. And it ended up being this kind of value-weighted index for equities that you wrote about. Do you think that still applies? I know you wrote it in 2011, I believe, and you know it's 10 years later now. Do you still think that applies? What kind of indicators of value would kind of qualify a stock to be included in that index today? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. So what I would say is that for better or worse, most people use the S&P 500 as their benchmark. And if you have a strategy that deviates significantly, you know, for assessing whether you beat the market or you didn't beat the market. And if you have a strategy that wildly deviates from that, it's going to be very tough for individual investors to stay with it. The evolution of that idea from the big secret We actually are still working through that, but we launched an ETF recently, the symbol is G-SPY, and really what it is, is it takes a nod to that and says, hey, you know, most people use the S&P 500 to assess whether they beat the market or not, and they can't take a lot of pain in terms of underperformance for long periods of time from the S&P 500. So what we did was we just created a new type of index where we buy all 500 names in the S&P 500. But if we think something's cheap, we'll buy a little more of it. If we think it's expensive, we'll buy a little less than what's in the S&P 500 as far as weighting is concerned. So we'll overweight things in the S&P 500 more than what's in the S&P 500. If we like it, we'll underweight something, still own it, but underweight it relative to how it's weighted in the S&P 500. If we don't like it or we think it's more expensive, And that'll keep the tracking error relatively low, yet still give us an opportunity to outperform. Obviously, not as much as if we had gone extreme, but probably enough, A, to beat the S&P and B, to keep investors who do buy into that strategy there to collect the returns. Even if there's periods of underperformance, they won't be very large and people will stay with it. So we're still struggling, I would say, with that concept in that book, The Big Secret, And, you know, there's different ways to win. I still believe, you know, I wrote, you can be a stock market genius on special situation investing. I still love all those methods. I wrote the little book, still love those methods. Big secret really evolved into this uh, G-SPY thing that we just came out with. And, you know, I think that's a great answer for a lot of people. And, you know, just having fun with it and trying to take these ideas and make them happen. Yeah, thanks for that. And so I think up until this point, we've really come full circle. I think we've talked about contrarianism to an extent. We've talked about a little bit of the history of value investing, how value investing changing today. And so I'd I'd sort of like to start closing with just kind of a general question, but you can keep it as short and sweet as you want. What makes a good value investor? So for all the students listening to this podcast that maybe aspire to become value investors and really seek out these bargain businesses, How would you simplify the main core ideas that they should ascribe to? Yeah, I think the ideas are well known. And I think, you know, I talked about them so far, but I can really tell you who I see. You know, I've had hundreds of students, close to a thousand students over the years, been teaching over 20 years. And just anecdotally from the people I see who are successful at this and not, you know, some people go into the money management business because if you're good at it, it's pretty lucrative and that attracts them. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But I see the people being most successful, the people who actually enjoy it. It's not a job. They're not there to make the money, although the money's nice if you're good at it. But they actually enjoy the process of figuring out puzzles or assessing everything going on in the world. They're seeking out opportunities within it. You know, there's a lot of reasons why the current events track into finding opportunities and people who really just enjoy figuring out the puzzle and why something may be attractive, and you just have fun doing that. Those are the people who end up being the most successful. And so I would say as a student, this is great fun, this business. And, you know, of course, you'll get paid well if you're good at it. But I wouldn't recommend there are far better things if you're really very bright and skilled and got a top grade education. There are many, many more socially valuable places that you can put those skills to work. 
Nevertheless, I've had a great career, really enjoyed it, wouldn't do anything different. And I love what I do. And I would only do this if I loved it. And, you know, it's an interesting conundrum because not only do I do this for a living where I don't think it's the greatest social value of what you can do, you can make arguments about what you're doing and allocating capital, all that stuff. But bottom line is it's not saving the world and the markets will get along without you if you don't go into it. And so what's interesting is when I teach my students, I tell them, hey, if you do this, it's not the most socially valuable thing. And I'm even one step removed from that because I'm teaching you how to do something that I don't think is that socially valuable. So I'm not even doing it. So what the heck am I doing here? And I explained to my students that it's been a fun journey for me, that if they end up being good at it and something I taught them was helpful to get there, that the only request I have is that they figure out some way to give back in a way that's important and meaningful to them. So in other words, take your success and make a difference someplace that's meaningful to you. And I think that's the way you can, besides helping any clients you have or you know, allocating capital, whatever, whatever you think that's worth, I think if you take your success and apply your skills and any dollar success you have in an area that's meaningful to you, that makes a difference in the world, that was my only ask. And I think that's the attitude that if you're going to be professional at this, people should go into the business with. Yeah, that's a really great answer. And it kind of leads perfectly into our final question of the day, which is with all my guests with children, I ask them this as the final question, knowing what you know now about value investing and finance and that whole investment world, what lessons have you given to your children about the world of money? You talked a little bit about students. Is there anything that you also teach your children about the world of money? And what do you recommend today? Sure. Well, you know, I have five kids and I recommend what I said, which is, hey, if this is interesting to you, I'd love to teach you. And several of my kids I have taught to be investors on their own, meaning invest for themselves. And those kids have been quite successful at it. And others have not been that interested and are doing other things, whether in the health field or other areas that are exciting and interesting to them. So that's all I'd say. I'd say, you know, I wrote these books that are good for teaching kids and and I'm not teaching my kids different lessons. Maybe we get to talk a little bit more, but if you're interested in this and it's fun for you, that's great. And if not, go do what you enjoy doing where you think you can make a contribution. And so I tell my kids the same thing I tell my students. That's great. And Mr. Greenblatt, it's such a pleasure to have you on this podcast. Obviously, you are probably one of the most perfect guests we've had, not only because you're you're so relevant to the topic of value investing, but because you're also a teacher and you also share this sort of idea that the best way to learn something is to really simplify it to the core basics. And that's really core to what we're doing here at Finance Simplified in the podcast. With that, you know, we'd love to have you back on at some point in the future. And yeah, thanks again for being on. All right. Thanks for doing this, guys. Good luck with it. Hey, everyone. That was the end of part two of our two-part interview with Joel Greenblatt on simplifying value investing. We hope you enjoyed and learned more about value investing from him. The entire conversation was amazing. Alex, what were some of the key takeaways from the second part? I think one key takeaway is that there's no such thing as growth or value investing. All investing, if it's intelligent, should essentially be value investing. Growth and value are, as Greenblatt says, tied at the hip. Another key takeaway is that the principles of value investing, or really just intelligent investing in general, can apply beyond the stock market. The main application of this type of investing has mainly been for equities, but it can really apply to any kind of investment. Right. And the main idea is to buy and sell around a stock's intrinsic worth. That's the path to success in investing, plain and simple. Agreed. Well, Alex, that wraps up our part two conversation and takeaways. And now it's time for us to tease the next episode's guest. Remember, the first person who sends us a message on Discord with the correct guest will get a shout out in the next episode. So here are the two hints for our next guest. Number one, he's the founder of Thinkorswim. And number two, he's an advocate for trading options. The next episode will be out on September 1st, so we'll talk to you all then. Hey guys, I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. It truly means the world to us. If you like this episode and others, let us know by subscribing and giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts and following us on Spotify. Share us with your friends and check us out on Instagram and Twitter, both at StreetFins. You can also follow me on Twitter at Rohan Invest. 
If you'd like to get in touch with us, please email fspodcast at streetfins.com. Thanks once again to Joel Greenblatt for his insights today. I hope you understand the topic of value investing in a more simplified way. Once again, we're really happy that you're taking the initiative to learn finance and to better your future. If you haven't already, we highly encourage you to check out streetfins.com for articles, videos, and other content. Join the Streetfins community and tell your friends about us so that they can learn about finance too. We'll talk to you next time on Finance Simplified.